Light, a show that explores earth and sky and the spirits that reside there through art, literature, magic, culture, and creative action. I'm your host, Chris. Enjoy. Okay, welcome to Liminal Light. I am Chris Rapucci. And I'm Eloise saint ange Obu. And we are here to talk about this next cycle of the moon through the 28 shapes. Uh, for those who don't know how we approach this and um, didn't listen last month, I'll just kind of say really quickly, uh, these are gonna be forecast episodes essentially but with um, what's commonly referred to as the lunar mansions, the way we work with it is um, kind of taking a step back and looking at kind of the broader tradition of um, the moon going through 28 or 27 places um, around the ecliptic and um, the zodiacal layer of, of that division of the moon's places. So we kind of situate ourselves primarily in the list from the prayer to Mene from the Greek magical papyri um, of the 21 animal shapes followed by the seven shapes of um, cult objects of Hecate. And then we reach out from there to kind of compare and cross-examine um, other traditions and what's mentioned for the peril place. Um, and we are gonna look primarily at the lunations as every 28 days, starting with the first um, shape or place or mansion, which in the Greek magical papyri is ox, to the last shape or mansion, which is key, um, you'll always get two lunations um, as it's one revolution of the moon around the zodiac. So this time around, we're gonna get a um, new moon in what we call scarab, which will also kind of be right on the border with um, Falcon. And then later we're gonna get a, a lunar eclipse in deer. Um, and we'll talk about dates and, and what degrees of the, the tropical solar zodiac those fall in, but just as kind of a review of what we're about to do. Um, so let's hop into scarab talk. Um, yeah, so this new moon is on the 11th, uh, yeah, 11 of May at 21, it's like at 2121 Taurus, I believe, which is just the last degree of Scarab mention, which is the fourth mention. Um, do you want to jam a little bit on Scarab? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot to say about Scarab, um, it's really interesting that, you know, just kind of in general, um, for people that also don't know that we, you know, for the past two years have been every single night um, doing um, automatic writing um, in kind of a ritual setting and, um, and drawing as well, and kind of um, using visionary practice to collect information and in all the places. So in that experience, we found Scarab to be a place full of interconnectivity, um, like getting a lot of images of, of scarabs or things that are like beetles, kind of interconnected uh, with things that look like uh, wires or channels or, or energy moving around and um, making these kind of formations. Uh, the idea of vital emergence, um, which kind of comes from the Egyptian um, imagery and conception of, of scarabs and how they work uh, biologically. Um, do you want to talk about how that, what they do? Uh, you mean like the actual insect? Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the cool <laughs> things I found when we were like doing research on this mention um, and I was researching scarabs uh, is that it's like the only known animal or insect that navigates with the Milky Way. And there's something about the light here because um, the symbol in Egypt was a lot about the 
like the resurrection of the sun. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting because we think about Taurus. If we think about Taurus, it, it's very different than scarab placement in a lot of ways, but there's something kind of consistent about the um, bulky demeanor, <laughs> the kind of steady, consistent, uh, like stubbornness almost. Like I think of the scarab as like very persistent. They they build their like little ball of <laughs> Dung. You were yeah. of dung, uh, for like a few different reasons some of it is to for food some of it is for eggs or whatever but there's something you know super kind of consistent about just like stubborn stubbornly pushing your your ball you know that is kind of similar to Taurus um and what I was thinking actually when I was yeah when we were prepping these notes is that there's there's like a there's a reflection of last year at this time because Venus was in Gemini. Also, there was like a few aspects that are very similar. And if we look at the new moon uh, last year um, at this time, uh, it was actually at the end of April, but whatever was kind of arising at this time, it's almost like we've been pushing it uphill and the ball kept falling, you know, downhill. And we're sort of at the same place as we were uh, last year at this time in some regards. And now this new moon kind of um, augures or like kind of foretells that whatever we're working on since last year, whatever we've been pushing uphill and felt like we're not progressing, there's kind of we're gaining traction now. And it's the consistency is the consistency of of our kind of habit or behavior that is leading us now forward but it's like it almost doesn't feel like progress because it's like um yeah it's almost like pushing this ball um almost in place or it's falling and it's we're, we have to push it back up and it's falling we have to push it back up or something like that yeah <clears throat> yeah and the ball that they what they do is they make a dung ball and as you were saying, you know, it's it's the food that um, will be eaten by the um, the babies when they hatch out of the eggs. So it's it's uh, also a brute. It's the nest and the food. So they um, they come out of like whatever their larva state, start eating the dung ball, and then they just emerge from the ball by the time they're fully grown. So when um, people would see this, uh, it just appeared that. Um, these fully developed insects were just emerging out of shit, you know? And like, they were, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, um, so this like vital emergence. And so it's very uh, Taurus, you know, that it's like the preparation of the soil and the compost and then life coming out of it. But rather than plants, it's like fully developed. So it is that, that uh, it was a symbol of resurrection, you know? And, and, and so that connection of the sun, it, like a year later, makes total sense um reflected through this moon you know because you're going to get like the lunations around the same place in the zodiac every year and this really highlights that soul lunar connection of like okay this is scarab new moon but whereas last year it was bull new moon because we talked about this in the last episode but we noticed that um we have to look more into how this is um how this cycle operates but we noticed that like uh, you know, at the end of, or, you know, at the beginning of May here, we'll, we'll always get a new moon in Taurus, but it'll be scarab this year. It was bull last year. Next year, it'll be a uh, bull again. Then it'll be scarab again. And then it kind of gets, one of them might repeat twice because it's, what it's doing is kind of flip-flopping back and forth about 12 degrees. Um, and so there's some sort of like the way the solar and the lunar cycles um, wrap up together that retains that, uh, elliptical like nature that's kind of off kilter but um so it literally is like what we were doing last year in bull is continued in scarab as it's the next shape over too you know um, um yeah and the reason i was saying this actually is also because last year's new moon in taurus which was uh, in bull mansion uh was conjunct uranus and saturn was just newly in Aquarius. So it was highlighting the Saturn Uranus square 
that we are currently experiencing, but it was just kind of like a little hint of what was to come. Um, and that's why I was saying there's something, you know, that kind of really slowed down our progress last year at this time, whatever was emerging, whatever kind of momentum we had, um, you know, there was kind of this slowing down process maybe due to Saturn Uranus square that is, you know, on now. Um, so there's kind of a, yeah, I can't, I, like um, a repeating pattern of this time last year. Now, also, Venus was preparing last year to turn retrograde in Gemini, and Venus, we know, rules over um, that part of the zodiac, um, it, like the solar zodiac. So it doesn't rule over Scarab, per se, but Venus rules Taurus. And so Venus in Gemini was, uh, last year was slowing down to turn retrograde. This year, she's direct. So it's almost like we're repeating a lot of things from last year at this time, but this time there's a lot more traction and it's the consistency and the stubbornness of this preparation that is allowed for traction now this year. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Venus um, turned retrograde around, I think around 21 Gemini last year. And, and this year Mercury turns retrograde in Gemini at 21 degrees, um, just as he's separating with the conjunctions from Venus. So Venus kind of meets Mercury to the spot that she turned retrograde last year, and then he turns retrograde. So there's, yeah, there's definite parallels between last year, this time, and this year, this time. Um, and then coming back to the same lunation, um, it gets really interesting. Now, you know, this new moon, because it's at the end of the fourth mention that we call Scarab, it's like really at the end. It's on the border of Falcon mention or the fifth mention, fifth space uh, or place. And so there is really an overlapping. And what we've noticed with the lunar places like this is that they're not, there's no boundaries. They're very elastic between them. So often there's signification that mel melts between them. And so if we look at this new moon in Scarab, just on the border of Falcon, we have to interpret both of these mentioned, the fourth and the fifth for this new moon. Now, yeah, the cause fifth because it's really close. It's like the mansion switches at 21 degrees, 25 minutes and 43 seconds. So it's just like like uh, four minutes off, you know. Yeah, it's basically the moon becomes new and then jumps into Falcon mansion. And so what is Falcon mansion? You know, this part of the zodiac um, is also where the Pleiades are. And so a lot of the sim signification of the fifth mention Falcon has to do uh, with sight. In our own research, we've we found this that was coming over again and again. But I think also because the Pleiades are located here and the, these clusters of stars are associated with spirit sight. Um, so yeah so it's almost like there is a vision that is held that's been held um or there's something about foresight or something about a vision that was arising last year that is kind of regenerated at this time with this new moon yeah and the, how I see it. yeah the and the Pleiades being like oracular you know and and that kind of like oh well we we if we were paying attention last year we, we you know could have participated in in the prophecy of of this year but it's interesting that like also sight in the sense of um <clears throat> the fourth lunar mansion which you know where scarab appears in the pgm is um aldebaran which is the follower um means the follower and it's it was the follow in particular is the follower of the pleiades like in the sky um and the aldebaran is also the um the eye like the kind of red flashing eye of taurus of the bull constellation um associated with with uh saint michael as one of the four royal stars you know um in the arabic tradition um and then you see in the picatrix it says you know you always see saint michael as as um on top of um satan kind of like the the serpentine like demonic satan like you know dominating him or, or spearing him or, or coming at him with a flaming sword or something and then in the picatrix for aldebaran in the elections there's an election for killing and binding reptiles and venomous animals um which becomes interesting again that that uh we get a scarab here like an insect because it's you know we don't get 
we, we don't get any other insects, I don't think, in the, in the um, you know, there's serpents and stuff, but this is the only insect we get in the list. There's crab, I guess, but. It's... Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And we'll get into crab in a bit. But then, you know, with the sight thing, so it's the eye of the bull. Um, and then there's some reflections into like the mythology, mythos surrounding that star that you see in the Picatrix, like indirectly being mentioned, but then there's more stuff like, um, with, uh, in the Grimorium Verum, um, this is, this is the, uh, the deputy of Belzebuth, uh, Tarkimake, uh, which replace is replaced by the name, uh, Lucifuge Rofacale in the Grand Grimoire and Lucifuge Rof Facale is kind of like a play on words, like Lucifuge is like lux, like lucis, like um, meaning light and uh, like fugio meaning to flee. So you get like light fleer and then Rofacale um, could be, you know, like Lucifer backwards, like, um, and then it's like this kind of, which Lucifer is like, you know, the light bringer and then backwards it might, it's sort of the light fleer. But then in, um, when you look at the, um, biology of like you were mentioning before of these beetles they emerge from the the brood nest the dung ball fully formed and they look for the sun if the sun is available if it's not available they look for the moon and if it's not available they look for the um the milky way as you're saying they look for some light and they use it to navigate um so this is talking about light fleeing rather than light you know drawing towards light and then the beetle we see like carrying the sun in iconography uh so there's some navigation by light and then in a lot of the the information we were getting with writing and drawing there was a lot of this kind of um everything moving together everything moving almost mechanically everything kind of on some sort of track um and there's some kind of reflection there also to the nature of Eldebaran in in um in inter astrological interpretation as a fixed star or in um used in magic as being sort of a kind of like a momentum to kind of keep the ball rolling. And it's funny as an expression <laughs> because the dung ball, but like, you know, that like momentum is like, it might be hard to get moving, but once it's moving, it's hard to stop, you know? And, um, you know, talismanically, you can use Eldebaran that way. Um, but interestingly, uh, Lucifuge Rofacale in the Grand Grimoire is associated with, um, with moving, um, you know, giving access to treasure. Uh, and like, or, or not, you know, like, um, let me see if I can see the line here. He's like the keeper of buried magical treasures. Um, and then <clears throat> in the Picatrix, one of the things in the elections is destroying treasure seekers. Um, and so there's like looking around these various traditions, you can kind of see them talking about the same thing. I mean, more is just kind of a plug of this like interconnected ness of of what you find in the verum to what you find in the picatrix and the verum probably working off like mansion timing um and yeah but i don't know it's just it all comes back around again to kind of what we uh we're talking about about like there's something here about light and then how that stretches into uh into falcon and you know falcons being you know we think of falcons and hawks and eagles just as being like sharp sighted um yeah and so you know in terms of like this new moon like how how you interpret it would you say that it's like um it's like a vision like a vision held type new moon or you know there's some like there's kind of more momentum now but it's it's almost like um yeah there's something about uh foresight or vision you know yeah. I'm trying to find like simply how to yeah how to kind of yeah see. totally it's very su supported it's a it's a very su supportive new moon it's supported by other planets sextile to Neptune trying Pluto um there's not really anything negative you know about this new moon it's yeah and those like sort of echoes of being sextile to Neptune you know and trying to Pluto like continues that kind of like oracular and buried treasure um yeah kinds of themes that just like are natural to this space and just kind of 
bolsters and emphasizes them. So it is a new moon. Um, so it's, you know, the classic like seeding of new things, like however you interpret that, like as, you know, this whole system revolves around Hecate. Um, it's not necessarily like an, like new moon intention setting, you know, but like there's some uh, beginning of some sort of cycle that's connected to, to vision and to, uh, to what comes through, like what's like permeates through and is able to almost see with like x-ray glasses, like into the earth, you know, and um, what potential is bar like was buried there and what is going to emerge, you know, and going from uh, scarab to falcon is also, it's like the the scarab is, a, is they're both uh, solar symbols, you know, in um, the Egyptian world, but one is, one is more direct, one is like the resurrection of Ra, and then the falcon is more like Ra itself. So this kind of, um, I don't know, the, like the, what, what would you call, um, like not the like despot, but like, you know, the deity or like, you know, having, it's what the Pharaoh would be filled with. So we talked about this last year too, and I mean, last uh, month too, in a different sense, but that agency over the land, you know, um, being able to like, have your actions suddenly be in your sight and able to be ordained, you know, to, to continue into motion. There's something really body I find with the, this space. Um, maybe it's also just because of my personal birth chart, but I find Scarab and Taurus section of the Zodiac to be very body oriented. So if we think like, because it's Scarab Falcon type new moon, it's like body and vision. Like what is your body? you know tuning into or you know consistently tuning into and what is it saying in terms of like um like what's the oracular quality of like the physical movement that you're doing or like where you're progressing with your body or something yeah totally like as scarab we found it to be sort of like about automata you know just like the all these insect bodies kind of moving, um, being directed by a higher mind or something and in a communication network. Um, and then then uh, Falcon, um, you know, the Picatrix is, um, let me look, is Al-Haqqa, which means the white spot. And the talisman that they mentioned for that mansion of the Picatrix is um, for receiving the favor from kings um, you know, so that kind of like connection back with it being Falcon to Ra and to kind of the Pharaoh. But then the directions for what you do with the talisman is that you carry it as a seal and put it in your bed for visions. And so it's like these visions that then bring the favor of King. So it's an oracular talisman. And it, being a talisman means that you're uh, finding a body uh, for the oracle to live in, you know, and that, you know, you can metaphorically extend that to your to yourself, you know, that like, your you are the seat of prophecy <laughs> yeah something like that yeah and i can attest that that placement for having made one talisman here in falcon for a site um that it's it's really it is bringing knowledge it brings knowledge um but there's something it's funny because the literature on like the pleiades which are sitting uh, around these degrees is really negative in a lot of delineation, like astrological delineation. Um, so, you know, they say that it's good for bringing vision, but most of the time in natal birth chart, it was thought to be more of like a negative omen yeah. to have these degrees. Um, well, cause you get like- um, Blindness. Al Algol in the, the Taurus side and then, and then with the, you know, Alcyon and into the Pleiades, it's, they're oracular, but they, they often are oracular in the sense of like, um, you know, Greek tragedy, you know, like the, you go to the Oracle and they tell you that, like, you're going to uh, sleep with your son and, and, you know, and then like your family's <laughs> going to fall apart and you're going to be the one who kills your father. And, and you're like, that's unbelievable. And then it comes to pass, you know, it's like the, the weavings of fate often involve these these kind of tragedies and disasters that are inexplicable, you know? 
Yeah, it's also associated, the Pleiades were associated with blindness from fever. And it, it made me think just like, because right now uh, the North Nodes and the eclipses will occur on this territory um, later on, and it has been, um, you know, there's something from like blindness from eclipse too. And the first two weeks of May are pretty calm in terms of astrological weather and stuff, but it is the territory of like, pretty um intense like weather at the end of may where you know mercury will be retrograde we're gonna have an eclipse in um gemini in june and the north node transiting there too so it's like there is a vision there might be like something very clear right now and sharp but it could burn or something there's something kind of a little bit uh it's it's kind of like a prick precaution to take is like don't get your eyes burned by your vision or something <laughs> yeah wear wear shades I, I just bought a pair of ray-bans so I'm, <laughs> so you're good i'm good yeah <laughs> but like uh the it's interesting that it's the new moon spans uh scarab and and <clears throat> and falcon and i want to talk about that for just one second that uh you know because in solar astrology the 12 signs of the zodiac uh, there's the talk of cusps and how they operate and, you know, there's different ideas. There's like the modern idea that you're like sort of both. And, and then there's the traditional idea that like the last degrees are kind of almost like this, uh, vortexy place. Like you're going into the pressure lock between, uh, between areas that are like gateways and the planet makes a splash as it comes through and all, and it scatters the significations a bit on both sides and all these things. There's, there's definitely some truth to all that, but that, but they're much more, separated um i think because of like the thema mundi and the thema mundi being kind of based on um like greek optical theory and angular like angles and and how vision uh sight lines and stuff and testifying but with the mansions it's like we're saying it's more of like a morphing of images and shapes and as you move through there's definitely like as you approach that barrier it's like it starts to like shape shift into the next thing um but you, you're spanning across Scarab and Falcon, which is Aldebaran and Al Haka, and um, in the Grimorium Verum, that's uh, Scarab would be the first deputy of Belzebuth, and uh, Falcon would be uh, Flority, the the second deputy of Belzebuth, and then when the lunation happens um, for the eclipse, uh, for the lunar eclipse in Deer, the sun is in um, Crab and highlights that that whole axis because like the sun is going to be on the north node while the moon is uh lunating on the south node across so it's just going to light up that whole like place as the the eclipse axes become a really important thing i think in in the way we we look at or at least the way we look at the lunar mansions and and where um where the dynamics exist uh but um crab is it um Alhana, which is a mark uh, in the Arabic system in the Picatrix, and then in the Grimorium Verum, that would be Belzebuth. Um, and so the two deputies of Belzebuth and then Belzebuth himself, uh, being kind of the, for people that work with that system, that goetic system, that's kind of the, the um, one of the three superiors, you know, there's Astaroth, Lucifer, and Belzebuth, and Belzebuth is sort of um, considered the the more dangerous of the three hierarchies to work with, and the and you have to have your protocol right, and you um, it's less forgiving, um, you know, if you don't kind of like stick to like a clean methodology, things get um, punishing. <laughs> like uh, so, you have to be a little bit more careful, um, and and so yeah, like I think that kind of is some sort of echo of of what you're saying about this section of the zodiac of the zodiac in whatever layer you're looking at it you know it's like as the the pleiades or um and like coming from algal into the pleiades and and being like okay well yeah it's it's taurus and gemini so you get those significations and but you also get um some some warnings and some seriousness like through like strewn across this part um, of the zodiac and maybe even this part of the year for a variety of reasons, like in a solar sense. Yeah, I came across some really interesting information on uh, the Pleiades and why maybe potentially this there was like negativity attached to them. Um, 
you know, I think it was uh, according to Ptolemy, um, it was uh, associated with active intelligence, but also causing blindness, disgrace, violent death. Uh, their influence is distinctly evil, and there is no astrological warrant for the <laughs> off quoted um, passage. Um, yeah, so that was Ptolemy. Um, but the author on the website, that's on Constellation of Words website, which is all about the fixed stars. It's really good, or all the stars. Um, and he noted that it has been said that many of the negative interpretations given by astrologers in the past on the Pleiades and other stars with feminine qualities was caused by prejudice against men with homosexual leaning. <laughs> Words like evil influence, as in the above case, is likely to relate to uh, homosexuality and unmentionable wor uh, word in those days. Um, other substitutions were not a good omen, omen with regard to relationships to the opposite sex, disgrace, immoral, evil disposition um, is only one of the many likely influence of the Pleiades. Um, so, you know, he's basically saying that like, like the wording of the traditional text is insinuating like evil influence, but it might not necessarily be that just like we've discovered with like a lot of the feminine mention uh, that, you know, have yeah. negative connotations. Yeah. And, and the Pleiades are the seven sisters, you know, and they're like the female oracles and, you know, like blindness, um, like blindness caused by fever and, and like kind of fever dreams and uh, like, the torment of trance when you're going into a vision and and like the like in um like Macbeth like the three like sisters who are blind and they have like the crystal in the, <laughs> the you know and all, and that's also in uh the Greek myths too and like it's yeah there's it's like femininity and like you're saying homosexuality and then the uh the uh prejudices of of various periods like you know any almost any period like but uh yeah you see that all over the picatrix in regard to like you're you're mentioning like any of the feminine archetypes the picatrix will tend to just be like oh this is uh really destructive it's really bad it's really evil yeah <laughs> you know? and this is something to remember and kind of repeat over again because we're basing a lot of our astrological magic protocols on these texts you know so it's yeah. important to kind of understand also that it might not necessarily be um evil or yeah. you know or dangerous uh, as like the tradition kind of states yeah or like what they mean by dangerous is like uh you know like moral disgrace right totally yeah <laughs> like they're like they're like oh that like that's a shady uh that's a shady place and you're like what is it and you're like oh it's just like a, a leather bar <laughs> you know like <laughs> <laughs> like okay i get it you know but then on one other hand, because we're talking about the light, you know, just staring directly at the light kind of hurts your routine, like your eyes too. So it's like, you know, you can kind of interpret it on many layers, but the light clarifies things and it brings vision, but also you can't really stare at it directly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With the solar archetypes there too, like Fal Falcon and Scarab and and like the being like the kind of warning of a like oh watch out when you work with Belzebub's hierarchy and then you see that the those two uh those two shapes in the in the PGM at least are you know are speaking of of Ra of like the king of uh, the king of deities you know and so you're like yeah of course you wouldn't want to mess around when you're in the presence of of the the top you know um but yeah I think do you want to hop from like yeah, just kind of like let's hop. We're, let's hop. Yeah, <laughs> as we're moving from like the eclipse axis, like already because we we're talking about yeah. crab, and we can kind of come back to that parallel. But let's move down to. So the, on the twenty sixth of May, we have a total lunar eclipse at five degrees Sagittarius, which falls in Deer Mansion, which is, you know, the twentieth place or the twentieth mansion that we call Deer. Um, so that's going to be an eclipse there, total lunar eclipse. Um, yeah, at the end of the month. So, yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Eclipses are, um, 
you know, we think of eclipses as sort of gateways um, in, you know, you know, well, like the head of the dragon and the tail of the dragon and, and Rahu and K2 and, and uh, <clears throat> like the head of the dragon being like always as being disconnected in a sense from the tail being always hungry or, or the head's job is to eat and devour and the tail's job, you know, the tail ends job is uh, to um, excrete waste. And, um, and so we'll get with the North node um, increase or a gate opening and, and things entering your life and being turbulent for that period that the gates open, like as there's like, um, you know, if you're stand on a train platform with two trains pulling up and that moment, um, you know, one going, one leaving town and one entering town. And that moment where like, there's all these people rushing off a train and all these people rushing onto a train and it's chaos. But, you know, for, for like an hour before that, everyone was just sitting on benches waiting for these trains to arrive, you know? So eclipse uh, seasons are, are turbulent as things are moving in and out of life really rapidly. Um, but this being a south node eclipse, um, it's things leaving and it's the end of the train pulling in and, and a bunch of people are, are getting on board and bringing their the stuff with them that they're leaving town with. Um, and that empties out that part of, you know, say it's your chart, like this is going to be in Sagittarius. So whatever sign you have Sagittarius in, it's like there are things being kind of um, cleansed out and leaving and that can feel a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes it feels like things are being robbed from you. Sometimes it feels like um, <clears throat> like you're just disinterested in, in certain things. You're like, yeah, I'm not, I don't really care about that anymore. And it just kind of moves out of your life. But um, this being kind of like the gate of excarnation, you know, like um, things are incarnated in... Um, in the North node and excarnated in the South node, like they move into the world and they move out of the world. They're, they, they're manifested and then they're <clears throat> destroyed. But um, so there's this kind of parallel to the, the solstices and, and kind of like the Tarokdini and, and uh, like Kautes and Kotapates, like the kind of, um, you know, things born into the world on the summer solstice and, and things leaving to go back to the world of the gods on the, the winter solstice is kind of like, this play that's repeated or, or that syncs up with and is related to the movements of the nodes and the serpent that uh, circles the world. Um, and so we can kind of think about those things, you know, kind of the way we work with, it's not really like archetypal astrology, it's more like vision and, and um, like embodied states. And, but we want to kind of imagine that this is the movement of this kind of uh, primordial world serpent that's you know often mentioned across like in the inception of all um, all you know cultural mythos. But okay, so just as can I say something about yes. the eclipse? Um, yeah, so not all eclipses are equal. So when we talk about the nodes, for those who don't know, when we talk about the nodes, the two nodes of the moon, they're theoretical points. Um, where the path of the sun and moon crosses the ecliptic, which causes an eclipse. So in astrology, we use the nodes to know where the eclipse cycle is happening. But the nodes, more extensively, the nodes of the moon are considered kind of shadowy planets. And so um, this, this lunar eclipse, what is a lunar eclipse? A lunar eclipse is a full moon that gets completely eclipsed. So you know, yes, it's a south node eclipse. So there's like this exp expulsion or something is ready to be spiritualized. That's often how I say, like talk about the south node. It's like something has reached its maturation pro process and is ready to return to the void. Um, but because it's a full moon and a full moon is like, call it's the culmination of something also that gets eclipsed. So, and that might just complexify or make things more complicated, but a full moon culminates, something culminates and is kind of ready to uh, wane or return into the void. But first, you know, we have the bright, something very bright or so, something very obvious, something culminating that gets eclipsed, that vanishes. 
<laughs> because yeah, if yeah. if we talk about just a full moon, because if this was not an eclipse, it would be a full moon. And if we talk about full moon, it's usually something very obvious. You know, it's something very obvious that is kind of the light uh, is being shined on. But because this is being eclipsed, it's almost like something very obvious that is ready to be recycled. <laughs> Yeah. Like and it's, it's kind of like in certain, um, like horticultural or agricultural situations when there's like, at a, it's like, Oh, um, like when you see that f bloom or when you see that like shoot come up, um, you got to snip it or else like, you know, like there are these times you have to make these certain cuts, like, um, and get rid of pieces of, of vegetation and certain processes. Like, and it, I don't know, I was just thinking about that as you were saying it, because it's a full moon, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, yep, that's, that's all, that's all grown, ripe, and, and it's ready, cut it off, get rid of it, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, 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 totally. Um, yeah, because the, yeah, the fact, and I think about it all the time, I don't think there's an easy answer for this, but it's, you know, we have to think, yes, there's something culminating, something coming to light that then gets eclipsed, you know, but this process, because eclipse occur for a year and a half in the same places in the zodiac, like this process is not something that comes out of the blue necessarily, it's something that's been sort of taking place since the first uh, eclipse of of these this angle last fall you know so i don't think it's like oh there's a totally different scenario that gets eclipsed or something i think all the pieces are in place already we're in the middle of this this theater play with with this angle on the zodiac the sagittarius gemini angle you know so this total lunar eclipse at five degrees sagittarius is more extensively calm a, the culmination of a process that began last fall. And then there was that slight eclipse in Sagittarius um, last, uh, last late May, you know? Um, the, yeah, and the biggest difference this time is that Jupiter, which rules Sagittarius, Jupiter enters Pisces on the 13th of May. So it's going to be the first eclipse ruled by Jupiter and its home sign. Um, which I think is quite significant because Jupiter and Pisces will square this eclipse. So I think it's like there's kind of a new element coming into the picture, but that might um, kind of uh, make something obsolete, you know? Yeah. So this new element coming into the picture creates like a stale or obsolete scenario. And it's like, this is done. Like, this tree is ready to be cut and burn. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, as maybe for examples, or just to mention the pattern uh, we're kind of getting out of, of lunar zodiac a bit, but whatever, this is like how it rolls. There's, there's various layers, but uh, the last, the, the last Sag uh, or not the last, but last year, the Sag eclipse um, that was like a, just a brush with shadow, but it was, it was ruled over by Jupiter and at the time Jupiter was in fall in Capricorn and um, getting just like totally tormented by Pluto and Saturn, but it was, it was on top of Pluto at the time. And so I think no one really expected it to be much of an eclipse, but it was an eclipse that was presided over by, by, by a Plutonian uh, like Jupiter. That was Jupiter is essentially like kind of a held hostage and abducted by Hades at the time. And then that was, um, like a couple days um, after the uh, uprisings um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. And it's a fire sign and um, multiple cities and at first in the country and then in the world were on fire um, for the sake of abolishing the police and uprooting systemic racism. And so that is really clear. It's like, that's what Jupiter would say um, in cahoots with Pluto. Um, sit, like saying like, hey, let's burn this motherfucker down. Like, you know, like like the let's burn cap like the Capricornian um, oppression out, you know. But this time around, and then the the eclipse that we got when um in the like right after Jupiter ingressed into Aquarius and was conjunct Saturn, um, or no, it was right before it was on the 14th of, of December, I think. It was right before the ingress, but it was right around that time. Um that um that was on that eclipse was like i think the first public uh vaccination 
And so it's 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 uh, K2, it's the south node and the south node uh, makes you sick, you know? Uh, and so like they had, they've already had to uh, pull a bunch of these vaccinations because of, of complications, you know? So it's, that's kind of foreboding. Um, Interesting. Then, yeah. I never thought about that, but it's true. I forgot the South node is often people get like, if it's touching in specific place in their chart, food poisoning is really frequent with the uh, South node eclipse too. Yeah. And you get rid of stuff because you're sick of it, you know, it's like purging. It, yeah. yeah. And so um, I didn't think that looked good for, uh, for the vaccinations, you know, it was like, it wasn't like on another, it could have been on another date around that time. I mean, it was close to the conjunction of Saturn and, and, and uh, Jupiter, which would have made more like, okay, here's the new advancements in the world, you know, but it was on the Sagittarius eclipse. Like it was kind of like, oh, okay, that, that doesn't look good. And it doesn't look stable, right? It looks no, like it that, yeah. that'll, that'll like, show results for a while and then it'll totally go off the rails you know and we have uh, some pretty uh interesting neptune uh like neptune <laughs> action happening you know like starting around the 23rd of may until the end of may uh, neptune is doing a lot of stuff and neptune is also associated with poison mm -hmm. yeah um so Mercury square Neptune's on the 23rd. Then we have this total lunar eclipse of in Sag, you know, south node purging, Jupiter and should, Pisces. We should, yeah, we should just, yeah, Jupiter and Pisces. We should just remind in that sequence, we are just kind of going over that this time it's going to be this eclipse ruled over by Jupiter in rulership, being concerned with like compassion and holistic health and uh, spiritual coherence and all the things Piscean, which there could be escapism in there. You can be totally tripping in Pisces, but in general, this is probably going to be a purge, uh, for, for good reasons, you know, like, it'll be like, okay, let's get rid of this now. You I know, like, think there's going to be a lot of magical thinking. I'm totally. <laughs> sorry to yeah, say totally. that, but Jupiter and Pisces, Mercury square Neptune, then Venus square Neptune on the 27th of May. That's all like, magical thinking or not really you know there's something kind of taking us out of the small details here something is being glossed over or something yeah totally yeah and i think um i've been thinking about this and talking to clients too there's there's the one narrative that like since it's a a reductive eclipse you know and it's it's lunar so it's probably it, it will tend for some people to be more physical rather than than mental like getting rid of some things um and it's sagittarius and it's like um i think for some people that's going to mean like having to sacrifice the quest that you're on and i think that's what it was it, last year you know when um you know people were you know uh lockdown happened people started to just like move their projects online instead of in the physical and everyone is getting used to that format and then the internet just kind of stopped where with like, um, you know, because of the uprisings and it was like, you heard a lot of people being like, I don't want to see your art. I don't want to see your project. I don't give a fuck about your music. Let's there. This is an emergency essentially. And, um, that, that just reminded me of the eclipse. It's like everyone's quest suddenly was like, no, you can't do your quest now, you know? Um, whereas this time, because it's ruled by Jupiter and concerned with the whole, I think it'll be more about like, refinement you know like um the south node can see can say now let's get of let's get rid of everything that's um preventing you from achieving your holy grail you know jupiter is at the bending of the nodes so that's also kind of you know it's yeah like in i think it's evolutionary astrology they call it a skip step so something has to be kind of revised something you know there might be something that was skipped and now Jupiter is bringing his new perspective and being like, hey, you know, this is a major element here or something. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens with Jupiter and Pisces for a variety of reasons. Some is that it's just going to be better, you know, Jupiter's the, like a benefic, but also just to see uh, coherence, you know, like from the start of the, <laughs> the pandemic and um, people using that phrase where they're like, wake up sheeple, you know? Uh, and I mean, that's just like, 
there's definitely going to be some major increase of of no, of understanding what's going on finally with Jupiter and Pisces. Yeah, but I don't think that around this eclipse that's going to be the case because there's so much Neptunian influence. I think there's going to be new factors coming in, but it's going to take it a little while before people can register that. Oh yeah, um, totally. And eclipses also, if you think they have an influence like six months uh, following the eclipse, it's not necessarily like, oh, on the 26th of May, there's a giant revelation and right. like God comes out of the cloud <laughs> in the sky and like speaks to the human. Um, I think if anything, the end of May is going to be extremely confusing because of all the Neptune influence and Mercury stationing retrograde and stuff you know, on a, on a bigger level. So even though Jupiter, yes, gives perspective, but that new perspective is, is really challenging and it's going to be kind of confusing. And I'm talking on a mundane level now more so than like in people's personal life, unless like this is specifically, you know, um, like somewhere important in your birth chart. Cause yeah. not all lunar eclipses are equal to, um, uh, to all, you know, to all, yeah, totally to all people. Um, it's, yeah, no, I totally agree. Cause then you see Mercury go retrograde soon after that. And it's like, okay, here's a bunch of information and with like in Piscean language and with uh, Neptune's involvement, it's like that in, it's like information that gets or knowledge that gets leaked and then it causes confusion, you know? Um, <clears throat> and, and even like last time Jupiter was in Pisces was uh, when we got a lot of the major, um, like that, like hundreds and hundreds of documents exposed with, uh, WikiLeaks and just like the language of that is hilarious too. Just like that. It was leaked out, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. Do you want um, to talk about dare a little bit? Just yeah, this place yeah, totally. where the eclipse takes place. Definitely. Um, yeah. So in our research, we found that there, where this lunar eclipse uh, takes place, which is between um, four degrees Sagittarius and 17 degrees of Sagittarius, more or less, between four and seven. So this eclipse takes place at the beginning of there mention. Um, and with there, there's really something about the edge of town or the border of the forest that keeps coming up a lot. It's almost like you get the repeated theme of Sagittarius, which is like the combination of a man and an animal, but more so in landscape form. So you have the edge of town where wildness begins that, that tends to show up in our drawings a lot. Um, and what I was thinking about was like, in terms of the mundane and what's happening is like, you know, uh, like mobility, because yeah. there's something about mobility right now, obviously, and there's something about mobility more extensively in this dear uh, place. You know, there's there's a lot of territory in their mention often. Like I always see like a, a field, a meadow, uh, sometime a fence, sometime an edge of the woods. Yeah, it's totally like the crossing of the hedge, you know, in kind of like Wiccan or witchcraft ideas. You know, it's like there's that the outside of city limits, like the perimeter wilds. And um, next to deer in the sequence is mouse. And um, and then so mouse, uh, if you're like, well, what would mouse be related to in this, that Hellenistic syncretic period and it's Apollo and Apollo has like a civic role and Apollo's sibling is Artemis who's related with deer. So you're like, okay, that seems to be what they're talking about when they're listing like mouse, deer, you know? Uh, um, and then Artemis is a deity of, of hunting and in the same kind of like of the wilds, like hunting, tracking, and that mansion, when you when you kind of cross com, uh, compare it, it's like right across the board. In the Picatrix, it's Al Naam, which means the beam, and so um, the beam could be, uh, you know, a like a beam. A beam is like something from the forest, uh, you know, harvested with wood. Or then we see the image in the Picatrix is um, head and arms of man and body of a horse holding a bow. So yeah, clearly, it's pretty. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> clearly Sagittarian. Sagittarius. Yeah, and, and, and then the, the election for taming wild beasts. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, and then like road travel and quick return, so leaving the city and coming back. Um, 
for people to come when you wish. So people being able to move from place to place, uh, good people joining together, a similar idea, but the talisman is for hunting in the fields. So again, kind of going out hunting. I think of these like kind of like British uh, period piece movies where they like go out to their country house and they go out and shoot a bunch of pheasants and stuff, you know? Uh, and then um, the the animal of course is deer. Um, the To make the talisman for hunting in the fields, you use a uh, wolf hair incense. So also like using material from the wilds and then um, use a tin plate. So it's recognizing that this is Sagittarius and the association with tin and, and, uh, and Jupiter. And Interesting. Then, yeah, totally. And then the, um, the Grimor Grimorium Verum, um, this, this like is another one that really points out the similarities between the Picatrix and the, the Verum or the, the uh, excuse me, the, the what's mentioned of the mansions in the Picatrix and the Verum, because the spirit from the Verum brings people from far away, which is basically almost the exact same language used in the Picatrix for men to come when you wish and go, good people to join together. And then um, how the Verum is syncretized to, um, to the Eshu and Kambanda, um, that Eshu is Eshu das Matas, which is of the forest or of the bushes. So again, like the hunting in the fields and the centaur. And, um, so this one, this is kind of the best. If you're like, when you put all the sources together and be like, are these all talking about the same thing? There's tons of overlap. And, um, <clears throat> but yeah, but like mobility and travel and leaving the city and people are going to be wanting to go on vacation you know well yeah but that's the thing that i was wondering when i was delineating this eclipse is that we have a full moon here so the territory gets fully illuminated and then eclipsed so you know is it a lack of mobility or the return of mobility um is it foreshadowing that new roads opening or available may get eclipse or may eclipse old roads um, you know, there's something about mobility and travel, obviously, but because it's an eclipse and it's a full moon, it, there's obviously a lot of parallel to what's going on right now. I know you guys in the U.S. are open, but here, like in Quebec, there's still curfew. The restaurants are closed. Uh, we can't travel between provinces. Um, I just heard one state in the U.S. I don't even know which one. Someone just mentioned to me, they were like, oh, yeah, one state just totally locked down again. And while other ones are totally opening, you know. Yeah, my speculation on a mundane level is that this um, this full moon eclipse, you know, this lunar eclipse here in Deer really shines a light on mobility or a like mobility eclipsed you know? yeah yeah just like <laughs> the the nodes making things like um like insatiable like in the north node sense or or like urgent to get rid of stuff on the um south node sense being like like oh fuck we got to get out of here you know um and it's hard it, to predict how this you know will it be the reopening of roads or the um, you know the like especially borders <clears throat> you know, borders between countries right now, if we're talking about edge, you know, head. Yeah. And... I think in and out of the, like, certainly, like, I think you're totally right. But I think also in and out of the city, I think people being like, we got to get out of town, we got to get out to the country. And then yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, dealing with like the, di the difficulties or the like what they have, like, maybe we can't take that with us, or maybe we can go this way, maybe we can't go that way. Um, and then you see right after Mercury turned retrograde. So I think people being like, okay, let's get the fuck out of the city. And then because it's nice out now or whatever. And then um, the logistics of that is Mercury goes retrograde. And if it's border crossing, then it's probably like, oh, well, do you have your papers in order? Like, can you prove you were vaccinated? Like, and, um, and kind of a scramble to officiate and notarize like, uh, the loop and find also to find loopholes and uh, how to like go about as you please, you know? Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see, um, especially with the Jupiter newly in Pisces. I think that's really going to bring a new element um, into the picture, hopefully. And like I said earlier, you know, it's not like, well, the end of May is a big scramble, but this will reverberate, you know, into the weeks and months to come to this it total lunar eclipse yeah i remember at uax seeing um benjamin dykes 
uh, go over some, I think, medieval Arabic material about um, eclipses and how to time when their effects would actually be felt. And <clears throat> I think in some cases, it's like a year and a half later, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, exactly. And also where they're visible and where they're not usually right. correlates with natural disaster. Um and all this talk of eclipse for people who don't know astrology very well, you know, it, it like sometimes it gets kind of people are freaking out about eclipse because the language sometimes is like very ominous. But, you know, it's it's also a natural occurrence. It's just a supernatural occurrence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I um, think it's just it's yeah, it's totally natural. Like things come in and out. Well, yeah, it's them. like what we started talking about eclipses. It's like it's ominous in the sense that, uh, you know, things aren't visible. And the reason they're not visible is because that um, that primordial uh, like world serpent that's usually invisible around the like beyond the perimeters of the horizon, you know, in some mythos, it's like circling the, the earth like, you know, 360, but it's just underneath the water, or the land suddenly is visible but what it does is is block out the light you know when you see the like massive leviathan rise or whatever you know um so it's just kind of like there is a moment where we're we're kind of like confronted with with what is like primordial or what is like um cosmic in that sense you know that's like beyond uh beyond time beyond space beyond conception as as like things move in out of out of the the the, the material dark, yeah, yeah the dark the dark matter you know from the void to the material and vice versa yeah or, yeah um, um i just wanted to mention that like you know because at that time you know the sun and the moon you know a, a lunar eclipse is a full moon and a a solar eclipse is a new moon just like with the nodes being 15 degrees like uh away so that 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 shadow occurs you know but um <clears throat> the sun at that point is going to be on crab um and that you know when we look at the shapes in the mansions uh the like the sh the 28 shapes like there are it is worth looking at what the axis is you know that like deer is in axis with crab and um and i was thinking about like well what is the significance of that as an axis and crab is like um, oceanic and insectoid and, and, um, <clears throat> and deer, you know, as we were saying, is like the wilds, but it's the wilds of the forest. It's the wilds of outside of civilization and into the woods. Whereas the crab is sort of like, um, the inception the, of civilization. <laughs> yeah. But it's the wilds of the ocean, you know? Um, yeah. But everything births out of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, totally. It's yeah, it's very procreative and kind of busy. Um, and I always see like human signatures in crab mention. There's something kind of like pulsion, the pulsion of you know procreation and stuff. It's very as opposed to the end of this the the lunar places and deer, it's we're you know, we're on the border of the city, we're back and forth, like between what the city means. Um, which is a totally different place. And, Ar and Artemis is associated with um, midwives and, and bringing like birth into the world. And then like you're saying crab and uh, procreation and the crabs association, cancer. And, and then, <clears throat> uh, but also we eat deer and we eat crab, you know? So they're not every animal on the list is, is consumed. Like we don't eat lions <laughs> or leopards, you know, or at least I don't. Or falcons. But, or falcons, <laughs> yeah. But we eat crabs and we eat deer. And so there, it doesn't, you know, when we look at crab mansion, we're not like, oh, of course, like fishing or, you know, like shellfish. But, but yeah, it's, it's one of the things that's like the bounty of the sea that's on the table in the still life, you know? Yeah, um, there's going to be a lot of action in that part in crab mention which is uh, 4 to 17 gemini so the sun will be there it's gonna shine all its light on the full moon but then um the full moon's gonna get eclipsed so the sun in crab um yeah that's interesting Re all like a reorganization of primordial primordial components yeah 
Yeah, and, and Crab is, uh, for the Grimorium Verum, is possibly where we find Belzebuth, and then the uh, the spirit in Deer is uh, Hippact, which is um, is in Belzebuth's hierarchy, which I think tends to happen with the organization of the of the um, the Grimorium Verum as it overlays across the the mansions. There's some. It's like we haven't totally decoded it yet, but there's some sort of uh, logic to it. Um, you know, for those of you who listened last month, I think this month, especially the new moon in Scarab, is a lot more. Um, it's a lot more grounding. There's a lot more traction. I feel like than the new moon uh, that we just passed in April, which was a lot more. Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like the new moon in April, it was in Vulture. Uh, Vulture was a lot more about like something, some process of decay, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's like we talked about that, like kind of eating the dead matter <laughs> to like, uh, to, to then like animate and some, some rebirth process, not rebirth, but some sort of process. And, um, but now, yeah, now we're breaking out of our dung ball and ready to <laughs> kind of like, <laughs> get get busy you know i always um, like talking about poo <laughs> yeah well it's funny because it's like then we get a, a south node eclipse after you know which is also associated with poo yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well maybe that's uh you should call it call it a night now yeah, I'm good. <laughs> before we go into like total poo. <laughs> scatological like <laughs> yeah, discussion sounds good okay well thanks everyone for listening um you know we're gonna do this every 28 days and so um come back next time and we'll get more into eclipses as that'll be the the solar eclipse in gemini and we can <clears throat> in june yeah in June, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. See ya. Thank you for listening to Liminal Light. You can find me at adavisceral.com, A T A V I S C E R A L.com, where I post forecasts and articles and offer astrological and divinatory services. For more discussions on the moon, go to lunarzodiac.com and sign up for our mailing list to find out about lectures, workshops, dreaming groups, events, appearances, publications, and whatever else. Now that the show is back on track, there's a bunch more guests lined up to discuss what is going on in the sublunar realm. We'll see you there.